Love finances, the other F word, and want to support the show? Become a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash FTOFW. You'll get special features, a shout out on the air, and early releases. Or if you prefer, pick up some merchandise at finances, the other F word.com. As fantastic a CFP as Mello is, and as wonderful an attorney as I am, please do note that anything said in our show are our opinions alone and are not meant to be taken as financial or legal advice. Welcome to Finances, the other F word, a Gen Xer podcast for musicians and music lovers, where we discuss money and music without all the pretentious bullshit. Here are your hosts, Zoe Terry, attorney at large, and Mel O, certified financial planner and author of Finances, the other F word. Listener discretion is advised. Hey guys, welcome to Finance is the Other F Word. And today on the show, Zoe and I are going to debate a little bit of the moral implications of capital punishment versus life in prison and talk a little bit about the finances behind capital punishment and life in prison. So for those of you who have been listening to the show for a while, you will know that uh, Zoe is against capital punishment and I am for capital punishment. And so this is going to be an interesting episode where... Uh, some things get revealed that you might not have known. So before we get started on this, there's a lot of things that, that go into this. And we've talked about this topic in a variety of different ways. And I wanted to draw you guys' attention to some of the past episodes that we've done in regards around this subject. Uh, Episode number 60, we talked about the profitability of prisons and the privatization of them. You can go back and listen to that episode. Uh, Episode number 139, we talked about being Black in America, and it was the prelude to our Economics of Discrimination series, which was episode 174, 178, and 182. In episode 199, we talked about the economics of the Supreme Court, and then we uh, kind of rounded this out with our defunding the police series, which was uh, episodes 205, 208, and 211. So if you, after you get done reading this, if you have any, you know, qualms about how you feel on either one of those, then you can go ahead and you can go read that. As always, all of the resources are disclosed. And I wanted to take a minute to remind you guys how the research is done. Uh, I go into a private window from Google and I start Googling very general things. I don't use a language as far as pros or cons or anything like that. I use very generic terms. And usually for me, and I don't know how Zoe does it, I pull up, you know, links that look familiar to me and or look um, look like they, they might be uh, of interest to me. And then I bank those. And then as I'm reading articles, if something else sparks, then I will use the links in those articles to go to other articles. And then I will go do a fresh private window Google search. And then, like I said, as always, all of the resources are always disclosed. Um, I don't know if you do something similar, Zoe. Ish. Ish. Yeah. So uh, like I said, you guys can feel free to go onto the resource, um, the resource links and you can look and see what we did. So I'm going to talk really quickly about some just generalized information. And then I'm going to talk about some of the financials behind life imprisonment versus capital punishment. And then Zoe's going to come in with uh, kind of the, the moral argument and, uh, kind of uh, feather out any legal stuff that I don't understand. So I am not an attorney. Zoe is an attorney, but she is not a criminal attorney. And so when it comes to a lot of the the processes with the criminal court cases, that's just not something that we're going to be covering right now because we don't have those expertise, number one. Number two, we still have the Ruggs case hanging over everybody's head here in Las Vegas. And I don't know if they would seek the death penalty. However, according to the information I found, they could. So let's get into it, shall we? So I'm putting on my glasses so you know shit's getting serious. Oh yeah, she's she's for real now. Because now Mel needs to fucking read. So Mm -hmm. here we go. Um, Death sentences can be imposed for crimes in which someone is killed or also called a capital offense, but the states get to decide which circumstances 
that uh, of a murder can qualify for the death penalty. So that's the the instance I'm giving you with rugs is technically somebody was killed. The state could decide to go after the death penalty. And we will find out here in a minute that Nevada is one of the states that capital punishment is legal. Capital crimes include murder, espionage, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and treason. Now there's death rows that are on the state death row, and then there's federal death rows for those things I mentioned, like espionage, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, treason, that's on the the federal level. And most cases, um, a convict can sit on death row for several years while the appeals process uh, goes through its cycles. And we're going to come back to that figure here in a minute. So as of July 2021, the death penalty was authorized in 20 states. Um, and as well, obviously, as the federal government, including for the U.S. Department of Justice, the U.S. military. And we're going to talk about federal death row here in a minute. The states that are currently uh, have the death penalty enacted are Montana, Idaho, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, Texas, which was the first state to carry out a lethal injection and in, uh, injection injections injection in 1964. And also it is the state with the most executions. However, this could be contributed if you're looking at all sides of the numbers, this would be contributed because they have limited the appeals process in the state of Texas, which we're going to find out that Florida has done something similar. Uh, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, Missouri, Arkansas, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. And in uh, June 14th, 2013, Governor Rick Scott signed the Timely Justice Act of 2013 to speed up the process of capital punishment cases, limiting the time to make appeals. So they did something similar that Texas had done. Uh, South Carolina, Ohio, Indiana, Wyoming, and Mississippi. And those are the 27 states that uh, still have capital punishment. Uh, Wisconsin was the first state to abolish the death penalty in 1853. Now, we are one of only 14 countries, the United States, that impose currently the death penalty. And those countries are the United States, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Japan, China, South Korea, Sri Lanka, and Taiwan. Currently, within the United States, there is 2000, about 2,500, I think the actual number is 2,501, um, but 2,500 people on death row in the United States. And since 1973, 186 former death row prisoners have been exonerated on all charges when they were proven innocent and that they showed to be shown that they were wrongly convicted or by current data, about 7.44%. And we'll talk about why that number is what it is here in a minute. Out of the 186 people who have been exonerated, 100 of them were Black, 67 of them were White, 16 of them were Latino, two of them were listed as other, and one was Native American. Now, as of October 29, 2021, the state's data shows that the people that were executed, 55.6% of them were White. 34.3% of them were Black, 8.4% were Hispanic, and 1.8% were listed as other. Now, this is a direct quote that I took from uh, the resources. I think it was deathpenaltyinfo.org. All the resources are listed. And this quote really, really hit me. So more, this is the direct quote. More than 75% of the murder victims in cases resulting in an execution were white. Mm -hmm. even though nationally only 50% of murder victims generally are white. So what, when we unpack that, what's that saying is, is that 75% of the murder convictions came when a white person was murdered, but white people in general only make up 50% generally of, of, of total murder victims. So you can take that however you want to take that, but that is a direct quote, and I thought that that was very interesting. Then we have a whole bunch of different recent studies that have come out. I tried to stick to ones that were as most recent as I could. Some of the data was from the late 90s, and I discarded it because it's too old. So this is directly quoted from the deathpenaltyinfo.org site because when I tried to rewrite this in a, a script format, it was too complicated because I don't want to fuck up on any of these details. So I'm going to read them directly. 
Jurors in Washington state are three times more likely to recommend a death sentence for a black defendant than for a white defendant in a similar case. And this was out of the University of Washington in 2014. In Louisiana, the odds of a death sentence were 97% higher for those whose victims were white than for those victims who were black. That's out of the Louisiana law in 2011. A study in California found those convicted of killing whites were more than three times as likely to be sentenced to death as those convicted of killing blacks and more than four times more likely as those convicted of killing Latinos. And that's a study out of Santa Clara Law Review in 2005. A comprehensive study of the death penalty in North Carolina found that the odds of receiving a death sentence rose by 3.5 times among the defendants whose victims were white. Again, so we're seeing the, the racial bias. That's out of the University of North Carolina in 2001. Now, the current death row breakdowns by race, and this is just all facts because I want to lay the groundwork for some of the things we're going to talk about here in a minute. Current death row breakdown by race, 42% currently of people on, on death row, this is on the state side, is white, 42% white, 41% black, 13% Hispanic, and 3% other. So we find that when we're talking about white and black people, as far as state death row, it's pretty equal as of the, the data that exists right now. 51 women are on death row as of October 1st, 2020, which represents less than 2% of the total population of death row uh, prisoners. Now, here's some just financial facts, and this is going to lead us into to what we start talking about. And again, these are cited in the resources, and these are directly from the website because writing them in a script form was too hard. So Oklahoma capital cases on average cost 3.2 times more than non-capital cases. And that was a study that was um, researched in 2017 for the Oklahoma Death Penalty Review Commission. Defense costs for the death penalty trials in Kansas averaged about $400,000 per case compared to $100,000 per case when the death penalty was not sought. And that is out of a 2014 study. Um, a study in California revealed that the cost of the death penalty in the, st in the state has been over $4 billion since 1978. It, it, that number... I would take as a grain of salt only because there's some things that they didn't disclose in that number, but um, that's what the study says. Study considers pre-trial and trial costs, cost of automatic appeals and state habeas corpus petitions, cost of federal habeas corpus appeals, and cost of incarceration on death row. And that was a study came out in 2011. And the last one is enforcing the death penalty uh, it, enforcing the death penalty costs Florida $51 million a year above what it would cost to punish all first degree murderers with life imprisonment without parole. Based on the 44 executions Florida, Florida, uh, Florida has carried out in 19, since 1976, the amounts uh, that amounts to a cost of $24 million for each execution. And that is a study that was out in January 4th, 2000. And I'm sorry, one more. In Texas, the death penalty case costs an average of $2.3 million. Um, and then we're going to round this out. Then we're going to switch to the, the finances here. There is a list in the resources, and I know that this is something that I put this in mainly for Zoe because um, she's a, a big advocate and she's, you know, nonprofit work is very big to her and, and very important to her. And there is in there, there's a resource that I have that is a website of people who were executed but were possibly innocent. And the website is extensive. And now federal death row breakdown by race. It's currently there's 45, according to the data I found, there's currently 45 people on death row and 44.4% of them are white. 37.78% of them are black. They are 15.56 Latino and Asian 2.22. Now let's start getting down to the numbers. And let me tell you guys something. I have been for capital punishment for as long as I can remember. And Zoe, I don't know if Zoe's, have you always been against it? Yep. Zoe's always been against it. Okay. So when I came into this, my strongest argument was that it costs too much money to keep these motherfuckers alive. So burn them. And I know that sounds callous in your hate mail to my PO box, 
Okay. But that's the attitude I came into. Well, unfortunately for me, but fortunately for me, because this is what I absolutely love about doing this show is that I'm not afraid to admit to admit when the data says otherwise. And I say this a lot of times when I say, I don't care. And I tell my clients this, I don't care how you feel about the numbers. The numbers are the numbers. Okay. So it's for me too. It's not just for people who disagree with me. And when I did the research and Zoe's going to caveat it on it as well, the numbers just don't say that. The numbers just don't say that. Now, so after I read this, and you guys can go look at the resources if you're still going to be pro capital punishment, which I still am, even after the numbers, um, you just can't use the excuse or you can't use the argument that that it's so much cheaper to just, you know, burn them or, you know, whatever. I mean, you just can't use that. So then at that point, it moves into a moral space. Right. I mean, that's really that's really what it comes down to. It's just people are going to disagree morally, but you can't argue the numbers anymore because based on the data I found, based on the data that Zoe found on our own Google searches and doing her own research, both of our numbers are coming to the same conclusion or very similar conclusions, you know, the numbers are always going to be skewed slightly. So, like I said, you know, uh, and, and I'm going to explain to you why that is right now. So the United States houses 25% of the world's population, but it is only third in population size globally. So we house 25% of the world's prisoners but we are only third in population size. So currently we are at 332,475,723 people. China is number one, India is number two. China currently has a little over 1.3 billion people and India has just, they're coming up right behind them very slightly at 1.3 billion also. But when you get in the hundreds of thousands, it's where uh, India is, is slightly lower than China. Okay. Now, one of the things I've already talked about the episodes we've done before, but since we're talking about profitability and finances, really refer to episode number 60, because in the profitability of the prisons, we focused on the services that come into the private uh, private prisons that have monopolies over how families that are on the outside can communicate and the things that they can do and provide for the prisoners on the inside. And they cost exorbitant amounts to do that. So I wanted to, to highlight that again, because you guys and all the resources are disclosed, but you guys need to really look at that because one of the things and all of the finances we're talking about at no point are we mentioning that because we've already mentioned that in episode number 60 and we're focusing on the finances on a government level not the finances for the families that are burdened with a prisoner who is currently in jail so let's talk about the cost of giving somebody the death penalty so states with death penalties have very detailed systems. And again, Zoe can talk more to that because I don't understand the legal system. I'm not an attorney, uh, but they have very detailed, complicated, intricate systems that are in place for people who are trying to obviously appeal their death row conviction. OK, now, because of this, a lot of times what we see is the criminal system gets bogged down in the appeals process. And we're going to see what time frame that that could look like here in a minute. And by the way, when I came into this episode, I was ready to go toe to toe with Zoe, um, not be on Zoe's side, by the way. So part, a little part of me is dying right now, just so everybody understands. <laughs> um, so the, and the reason why there's a very a variety of different appeals, uh, some of them are under the cruel and unusual punishment protection of the, uh, the eighth amendment, amendment of the constitution. And then some of them are equal protection where there's concern that there's racial bias within the judicial system, which again, we've already covered. There's pretty strong evidence that that is the case. There was on the cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, I remember when I lived in Washington state, there was a guy who was in prison and got enormously fat and, um, or maybe it wasn't Washington state anyway. And for whatever reason, back in the day when this was hanging was still an option. And there was a concern that if they hung him, his head would come off because he was too fat. And I, I don't, and so he was, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because he was doing this under the cruel and unusual punishment protection. So that's one of the things that can cause the appeal. If you have somebody who's on death row, you have higher security costs while the person is on death row because of the their death row inmates. And so while they sit there and await execution, there's going to be higher costs that are associated with that. 
there's an increased number of agencies that are involved in death penalty cases. Um, if somebody goes for the death penalty, like let's say in the, the uh, example of rugs right now, if, and I don't think they will, but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think they'd be successful even if they tried, but if say the state of Nevada was trying to go after rugs and uh, for death penalty um, there, and, and he doesn't get it, let's say he ends up getting life in prison or something of that or they, you know, somehow exonerate him or whatever the case is, the taxpayers would have paid all of the money to actually try for the death penalty case. And then they would have had to still incarcerate the prisoner for life in prison. And if there's a retrial in there, because if they did not find enough evidence to convict the person to death, then there's a potential for a retrial, which then gets us back into the legal system. And here we go around all over again. And the appeals, as I talked about here a, a minute ago, the appeals court system, um, the appeals slow down the court system. And in California, which is the slowest state for processing death penalty appeals, a convict can sit on death row for 20 years mm -hmm. before they exhaust their appeals, which if you, anybody has, has heard anything you hear, you know, he's been on death row for 15 years. Why the fuck has this bastard been sitting on death row for 15 years? Oh, the reason why is because he's still going through appeals and the court system can only move as fast as the court system can. That's California, but the average nationally is nine years. So we're still talking about a, a good deal of time where we're dealing with appeals. We're putting, we're bogging down the system. And on top of it, at the whole, the same time, we're still keeping them on death row and paying for the higher security costs while they're sitting on death row. And in the meantime, taxpayers are also flipping the bill for providing public defenders and court staff and a whole myriad of other things that are behind the scenes that I don't see, know, or understand. Death penalty cases are often requiring a death penalty certified attorney, which costs more. I don't really know what's entailed with that. I didn't even know that was a thing, but apparently it is a thing and it, it costs more money for those types of attorneys. The appeal process can be used in almost any case. However, we really only see it used to its full extent when somebody is facing death. Okay, then you have jury selection. So if you were, if you had a death penalty case and you had me on the juror versus, uh, and, and Zoe as a juror, that's going to take a little bit longer, depending on if you're on the prosecutor or defense side, to get through us to see if we would uh, be somebody that you want on our jury, because I guarantee you we'd have very differing views on that. Um, and so some estimates, and this is where the numbers get a little blur blurred, some estimates put the cost of death row inmates to $1.2 million higher than having a general population prison inmate. And I'm assuming this is over the life expectancy of the, the prisoner. And uh, with DNA evidence, uh, we touched on a little bit about how it has exonerated people. Well, doing DNA is very expensive. So if you have somebody who is being accused of murder or being accused of something like that, that you need DNA evidence uh, in order to be able to convict them or get them off um, in a capital offense, then that is going to add to the cost of the capital trial. I would still argue uh, that I would rather do that even if I'm facing life in prison, but I don't know. Again, I'm not a criminal attorney. And if there's criminal attorneys out there and you want to come on and, and school us, that'd be great. Um, and we can't get rid of the appeals process because that's what everybody would want to do. Like, okay, it's taking too long. This is too expensive. It's bogging down our court system. Why don't we just start the appeals process? Well, because that's in violation of the civil rights that all Americans have. Now, this is just some very recent data, and then I'm going to kick this over to Zoe. So the Federal Bureau of Prisons spent nearly $4.7 million on the first five executions carried out between July and August 2020 under the, the Trump administration. And they did, they petitioned a Freedom of Information Act. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, uh, did a Freedom of Information Act and all this stuff was disclosed. And they showed that in order to do, um, uh, you know, when you have somebody who's doing capital punishment, like I mentioned before, you have all of these different agencies who have to 
who has to come in. And they had for those, I think in total for those prisoners, about 50 different members of the Bureau of Prison Special Operations Response Team and Disturbance Control Teams that had to come in. And this number is inflated because COVID was going on all at the same time. So you had bag lunches having to be provided to everybody and you had limited staff already and you had people getting sick. And so the, the numbers are a little convoluted. And uh, so they had to disclose how much money it actually costs for them to put these 20 people to death. And I don't know what the circumstances were of those cases, so I can't tell if they, they should have had it happen or not. I'm just telling you what the numbers are. And it's because of, again, this intricacy with having to deal with capital punishment stuff. And right now, uh, based on the numbers I found, and Zoe might have differing numbers because depending on what you're reading, they can vary, but the price tag for a federal incarceration of an average prisoner is typically anywhere from $31,000 to $37,449 a year. And so um, that's really all I got. And so this is, the, this is the thing. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that. And I'll, 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 I'll expand on that in a minute, but I want to, I want to get Zoe because Zoe's very much, this is, she's passionate about this. So. Yes, 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 I am. And I don't know whether part of it is, is cultural um, because from, uh, from my research, still a majority of people in America afford the death penalty. Um, I, found, I found the opposite. Oh, did according you? To, yeah, according to see, this is where numbers, this mm. is where you got to kind of take the numbers as a grain of thought, but, and we're not trying to tell you how to think we're just trying to give you a launching pad. Mm -hmm. But according to my uh, data, I found it's in one of the resources link 61% of the United States is against the death penalty. Uh, maybe I misread that. But I mean, polling numbers is something completely different right. to That's cold, true. Hard, That's true. cold hard facts of, of, you know, uh, you know, how many people have been executed, how many people have been exonerated and stuff like that. That's that's different. But either way, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously I'm from England. We haven't had the death penalty in England, Scotland and Wales since 1965. OK, so way before I was well, not way, but before I was born, it, this is not something we do. So uh, I, I've grown up not only not having it, not even having to really think about it, but if I have had to think about it, particularly because I went into the career I did, it's something that offends me, offends me greatly. So we've not had it in my country since 1965, in Northern Ireland since 1973, which was the year I was born. So, you know, knocking on 50 years, it's not been something uh, I, I've had to consider. Um, some crimes in, in the UK were, were still punishable by death, such as treason, until 1998 so that's relatively recently but now it's it's just it's not something it, it, not that it was ever done but it was still on the books it's, it's not anymore um obviously I, I went to school to become a, a lawyer in England and I did I went to school and did a law degree and then went to law school and I remember one of my classes at university when I was doing my law degree was the criminal justice system and I remember very clearly having this discussion um about, and writing a paper about the death penalty and and form you know having to put my views on on paper and I still have exactly the same views now as I did then the death penalty for me is there's so many reasons why I'm against it first of all it doesn't work as a deterrent there is absolutely no evidence that it works as a deterrent states where they don't have capital punishment do not have lower crime rates so if that's your argument for it, it, that's just not a reason. I think for me, one of the biggest reasons I'm against it is the miscarriages of justice, which we have, we, we have seen over the years and we continue to see, especially with the DNA and uh, DNA evidence, which is becoming more and more sophisticated over the years. And you, kind of, you mentioned it earlier, but kind of briefly, since in the USA since 1973, when uh, the death penalty was reintroduced around that time, 186 death row inmates have been exonerated. So that's 186 people who could have died and would have died, but didn't, thankfully, but should have died and would have been killed. 
and they were innocent. So that's 186 p- innocent people would have died. And, and I think people are just like, oh, well. And in fact, my, from my research, at least seven people have been executed who were later found to be innocent. Ha, is, is, that a, is that justifiable? Is that like for the greater good? I, I don't think so. I think one person who is innocently executed, but, you know, who is innocent and is executed is one too many. So, so miscarriages of justice, and we see them every single, at least every single month, somebody who spent 20 odd years in prison who suddenly is, is exonerated. So that's a big, big reason for me why I'm against it. We, Mel's already discussed in details, it costs from, from some of my research 10 times more to keep someone on death row than it does to keep them in, in prison for life. And, and as she also pointed out, it, it, on average, someone it will take at least nine years. And in California, and it, it very much depends on the state, but as she said, in, in California, as you said, up to 20 years before someone's executed. What is the point? But anyway, um, and and. Also, for many people, the method of capital punishment is, is considered to be inhumane. There's been many recent cases of, of people who have been uh, used lethal injection on them, and it has been a really awful ending. Now, some people may think, ah, whatever, they deserve it. But, uh, you know, that's, that's not for me. I, I don't, I, like I said, I, I, I just, I'm just dead set against it. Um, the, like I said, it's not a deterrent. Retribution. I, I don't. I don't go for this eye for an eye business. Is that the kind of society we, we want to be in? Okay, this person murdered someone, so we're going to murder them. Are we going to follow that through? If this person raped someone, we're going to rape them. This person burned down someone's house, so we're going to burn down them burn down their houses it's it's i think it really boils down to what are our reasons for for incarceration what what are our reasons for the criminal justice system right and from going back to my my studies and from my research for most people the reasons for for criminal the criminal justice system and incarceration are deterrent retribution rehabilitation and inca- incapacitation we've already talked about deterrent capital punishment doesn't work retribution i guess if you, some could say you're getting your retribution your uh your revenge if you like on that person kind of but maybe not if you want that person to die for what they've done um eventually they may well um die but one of the uh, articles that i read and it's in the notes was uh, an interview with a guy who was on death row, then got moved to general population, and then actually got exonerated. And he said, I'll tell you what, I would rather be on death row than in, in general population any day. Death row was, was a cakewalk compared to general population where it's, uh, you, you risk getting killed, beaten up, raped. The, the conditions were awful. Death row was, you know, I mean, of course, it's not cakewalk, but, you know, it was so much easier than than the general population. So if you really want to punish someone, put them in prison in the general population for life rather than on death row when they have a cell to themselves. I mean, granted, they don't most of them. I think it's 93 percent of inmates on death row don't get to leave their cell for uh, are in their cell alone for 22 to 23 hours a day. But still, that's preferable than the horror of being in general population. And, and we'll get to this in a minute. S- people seem to think that that's the only two alternatives, killing them or putting them in, in life in prison for, for life. And, you know, some of us would argue that there are other possibilities, such as rehabilitation. Now, incapacitation was the other, um, you know, other purpose for incarceration. And obviously that that is met by putting someone on death row because they are incapacitated but like I just said in a much nicer way than being in general population and rehabilitation is that not anyone's goal anymore don't we want to somebody who's committed a crime at 20 do we not think that they they there may be some if 
if not some level of rehabilitation po possible, how about researching and studying these people to try and find out what the what happened so that we can prevent things in the future? I just think it's just so nearsighted to just think, ah, let's kill them, even though that doesn't actually happen for nine years, 10 years, 20 years, uh, and drains uh, the people's resources. And uh, ultimately, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know how I would feel if somebody hurt one of my children, but I still think I would rather see them rot in, in jail than be killed because that's how I think I feel. And I'm going to jump in here real quick because I want to draw you guys' attention to um, our defunding the police episode series. We talked about that a lot of the cities, when they're talking about defunding the police, they mean that they're trying to put resources to instead of having officers coming out to where there's a place where there's obviously somebody who's mentally disturbed they send out groups of people who are trained in that freeing up the officers to go handle really bad people and then sending out groups of people who can take those mental people try to get them help and try to um to de-arm a potential situation that way so i just wanted to again send you guys back to that series because we do a lot of research and all this stuff is connected so go ahead I'm sorry about that I just I wanted to jump in for I forgot oh no no jump in whenever and Mel touched upon this too about the disparity in well the the judicial system and the prison system that is alive and well in in death row too um, you're more likely to be sentenced to death if you're poor and a person of color and it was not that long ago that people were, were still being executed for crimes that they committed as a child, as a juvenile. How is that right? And, and not that long ago that people were still committed, that was, was still being executed, that were, were mentally incapacitated. It, so the figures I read were 22 people were executed for crimes committed as juveniles between 1976 and 2005. It wasn't until 2005 that the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional for, um, for an individual to be put to death for a crime that they committed as a child, which it floors me. And it was 1986 when they banned people who were insane from being executed. Again, that floors me. And 2002, when they ruled it was unconstitutional for dis mentally disabled defendants to be executed. What planet should any of those groups of people be being put to death, you know, as opposed to being treated? So, you know, I, I just so they're, they're kind of like my moral reasons. But uh, Mel touched upon most of this, but the cost of imprisonment First of all, most state, it differs from state to state, but most states spend far more per person on their in, in people who are incarcerated than they do on their uh, K through 12 kids. So for other people in other countries, from their school kids. And that is so, it's so ridiculous because if they, if it was the other way around, then it would, it would have a knock on effect on crime. If you put your money into the kids early on, then it, it should have and would have an effect on, on crime, right? And the costs of keeping someone incarcerated, again, it differs from state to state, but from my research is anywhere from 60 million to 8 billion per year, depending on, on, the, on the state. And the average cost from my research, and obviously we're looking at different articles from different year, but it's anywhere from 25 to 30,000 per prisoner per year. Again, you can look at like states like New York in 2015, they were spending just under $70,000 per year per prisoner. California, Mel touched on this, is pretty close behind uh, with about $65,000 per prisoner but its prison population is three times the size of New York. So its annual prison costs are about $8.5 billion, which is just, it's, it's just crazy. And as we said, it costs a lot more to execute someone than to keep them in prison for life. And that starts right at the point of trial, which I think Mel had said that I would touch upon, right? Because if you're if you, 
you start from a death penalty trial and a life in prison, uh, you know, a, a, a trial where someone is the potential um, punishment is death penalty as opposed to the potential punishment is life with or without parole. The death penalty trial is going gonna, is, is gonna to cost more. The whole thing is going to cost more right from the start. And that's because a death penalty trial is more expensive because of the amount of experts, the amount of witnesses usually. There's usually more attorneys. As Mel said, you usually require more experienced attorneys that are usually death penalty certified, so they have a higher salary. Now, the reason for that is because um, I imagine, although I don't know because I'm not, I never have been in the, the criminal realm, is that another reason for appeal can be ineffective assistance of counsel. Mm. So I'm, I'm guessing that to try and curb the, the onslaught of appeals for that reason, uh, the courts are, are mandating that for public defenders who want to take on death penalty cases, they have to be death penalty certified. So you can't just have any Joe blogs down the street saying, yeah, I'll try a death penalty case. Never done one before, but let's give it a shot. And then they do fucking terribly because it's, <laughs> and then right off the bat, whether, whether the, the, the accused did it or not, they've got grounds for an appeal because they've had ineffective counsel. Right. So I imagine that's, that's why, but so like, like Mel said, the attorneys are going to have to be more experienced and so high, have a higher salary. There's usually a lot more testing involved. As Mel said, the security costs are higher in the court as well as in the prisons. So right off the bat, the trial costs are, are way, way, way more expensive than a regular life or, or life with or without parole trial. And then if they do get convicted and they go to, uh, go to death row, it doesn't stop there. If, if even if they don't appeal, the, the execution isn't going to be immediate by any stretch of the imagination, and they'll be kept on death row in a solitary in solitary cells, needing guards and extra security. The guards have to bring them everything from toilet roll to meals, um, and they're in their cells for twenty two to twenty three hours a day. So everything is more expensive about keeping that those individuals on death, death row even if they don't appeal but most people do and so then you've got the appeal system which is expensive and long and all that time that the appeals are going on through the court you've got the salaries of the court staff the public defenders and every you know all the staff in the in the prisons adding up and adding up and I read that the national average, I think you said the national average is nine years now between, uh, yeah, that's between right. conviction and execution. And in California, we both read the same thing, is, which is the slowest. The average wait is 20 years. So someone is going to sit on death row for 20 years before they, they get executed. Um, California has the biggest death row population. And my research shows that it costs an extra $90,000 per inmate to imprison someone to death. So that's, that's a lot of money. And I, I told you already that um, one of the articles I read, a prisoner who lived in both death row and then in gem pop said, and was then exonerated. So here we go, another example of someone who would be dead, said he much preferred his time on death row. The horror of gen pop was worse than dying his quote so um it's really about you know what you what you want do you want rehabilitation do you want d deterrence do you want to to try and and understand these people uh, to try and prevent things from happening in the future if that's possible um do you want retribution what do you want as a society uh, what message do you want to send to others and, you know, I've read some articles where, where people said, you know, the reason this all takes so long is because we don't do what Saudi Arabia does and just take them outside and shoot them right after the um, after the, the conviction. Eh, is that where we want to go? Because then we won't have people sat on death row for 20 years. But we'd also have, what, 186 people who would have been exonerated because they didn't do it 
be that, that would be that would be dead this is that okay on the general just because you know 186 people when how many have you said 2500 have died since what, no, 2500 is the current on, on death row right correct. yeah current number actually it's 2501 but yeah 2501 yeah. so i just i just morally financially ethically it just no, it just doesn't make make sense to me and like i said as a uh coming from a country who hasn't had it in their heads hasn't had it as even on the on the horizon for the whole of my life uh, i'm i'm glad that it's not not something i've had to deal with i don't like the fact that i live in a in a state where it is an option i don't i don't i think it it's been many years since nevada has last executed someone but I didn't, yeah, I didn't check on that. I, I did at one point, and it, I know it's been a number of years. I want to say like at least 15 years since they executed someone. But that gave me pause and, and concern having children here um, thinking, shit, you know, because I do believe there are many, many more miscarriages of justice than the ones we even know about. Uh, I, I just uh, it, it frightens me. And uh I'm just against it very, very much. And nothing that my research, nothing in my research gave me, um, you know, any, any reason to change my opinions either. So. So if you're watching on YouTube, you're seeing me smirk right now. I see um, you smirk. Yes. I'm smirking so hard. Zoe always tags me and stuff where she says that, you know, I laugh at my own jokes and I die, you know, that I would want to die. If I could choose how I die, it would be laughing at my own jokes, which is completely true. And I want to tell you guys, the reason why I'm smirking is because I'm fascinating myself about me. And, and that's not me being conceited. This is the honest truth. So for those of you who have listened to the show for a while, I believe in God. She's an atheist. Mm -hmm. That's cracking me up internally because as she's going through her moral stuff, I'm like, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And and Zoe, out of the two of us, is always the bleeding heart out of the, the two of us. And there's probably yeah. listeners, and this is why I love doing the show, because there's listeners out there that'd be like, yeah, fucking Zoe's right. And they'd be like, yeah, Mello's right, which you should be more on my side. But yeah. um, but the the point I'm trying to make, it hasn't changed my mind. I'm still, mm -hmm. I'm still a hundred percent pro capital punishment. But you can no longer use the excuse that it's cheaper. So a lot of times, like we talked about on the uh, the OK Karen episode, which I'm getting a ton of shit on TikTok about. Are you? Way, I oh am. My God. I'll tell you about it offline. Mm -hmm. And then five of the videos didn't post that were scheduled. So now I have to schedule those. So that's going to be another shit storm. Um, we talked about how sometimes the Karen memes can be cloaked in misogyny. And so a lot of times people will use numbers to hide behind things because they just don't really want to come off as a bad person. And I would rather research the topic, share it with you, disclose the resources so you can make your own decision if you're so inclined or if you just want to listen to us and that's fine, you know, whatever. But literally the moral, ob the, the moral arguments have, have not swayed me at all. Um, financially, if I'm standing as a, a CFP, then yeah, this makes absolutely no sense to do capital punishment. If I'm looking at it from purely financial part, but now that that's been disproven, according to the data we have as of now, then you have to look at, well, I'm just okay. Killing people. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. that's literally what it comes down to. I mean, and I'm not, you know, and I, and I'm not trying to be controversial, I, I, literally that's what it comes down to. Just like Zoe and I have talked about, we've said on the show, we are both pro-choice. So you will have people who say, uh, I am, you know, pro-life unless it's incest or rape or whatever. Okay. Well then you're pro-choice. That's the way it is. I mean, and so when we're talking about capital punishment, it has nothing to do with finances. It's about a personal moral belief. And I still believe in capital punishment. I'm glad that I disproved the financial argument, but I still, I'm still pro it. And that's why I'm smirking because in my head, Zoe is, is talking like she would be a believer in God about moral and, you know, trying to rehabilitate and see the best in people all the time. And I'm over here like, fuck it, kill him. <laughs> and so 
that's what, that's why I'm smirking. So if you guys are on YouTube, you'll see, like, as she's talking, I didn't want to interrupt, but you can see, like, I'm starting to get that Grinch smile. Like I keep smiling hard and harder because inside I'm cracking myself up and I'm, I'm learning about me, which is I'm, as far as I'm concerned, the most fascinating topic to me, to me. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, anything to add, Zoe? I don't think so. I think I th <laughs> uh, it just makes me sad. It really does. It's a topic that makes me sad. But there you go. And you know, we might we might explore this again um, with a, a really controversial case that might come up, and we might dig deeper into this. But this is the information we have for you now. Uh, I believe that this episode is airing on Thanksgiving. Oh, let's all give sure. let's all give thanks. I'll give thanks to the fact that the country I'm from doesn't have capital punishment. That's and, and you can give thanks that your country still fucking murders people left, right, and center. How about that? <laughs> how however you want to look at it, we hope you guys are having a good Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, hopefully yeah. you're not listening to this on Thanksgiving. The cranberry. Right, exactly. <laughs> hey, did you know that we have 2,500 people on death row and some of them could be innocent. 2,501. Uh, and by the way, Thanksgiving's not my holiday, so I won't be celebrating. No, he, be, he doesn't give a fuck, you guys. No, so. but I, I will be giving back to the country, which is my home. So She will. She will be volunteering all day. This yep. is what I'm saying. This is what cracks me up. She will be volunteering all day <laughs> uh, with the Trauma Intervention Program of Nevada. If any of you guys are residents in Nevada and you want to learn about that, you can reach out to Zoe at Zoe at finances, the other F -word .com, and you can ask her and I'm sure she will delight you and bore you with as much information on the TIP program as you can handle. I certainly will. Yes. And you can follow us on our finances, the other F word media channels. Um, you can also uh, follow Lily Lou Mittens on Instagram and my book finances, the other F word, another F word to love Barnes and Nobles, Target, Walmart and online and Amazon, of course. Just quickly, it's Barnes and Noble. It's Did I say Barnes Nobles Noble. again? Okay, whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about. And with that, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. We, we <laughs> hope you had a good Thanksgiving at the time you're listening to this. But with that, we're out this bitch. Cheerio. Thanks for listening. If you like us, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.